Hi, I'm Rachel Nordlinger. I'm a linguist at the University of Melbourne, Australia. Welcome to Abrelin Al Vivo, Linguists Online, which is, as you know, a fabulous initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association. <clears throat> it's my pleasure today to introduce my colleague, Dr. John Mansfield, also from the University of Melbourne. John's research focuses on the typology of morphological complexity with a particular focus on the processes of variation and change. He combines hands-on fieldwork on Australian languages, especially Murimpata, with a, a, a broader interest in, in bigger and interesting questions about how we can use the typological study of morphology and word structure to understand processes of language change how diverse linguistic structures evolve and how they are deployed in social interaction. Today he's going to talk to us about the determinants of linear order in morphology and syntax. And I thank him for his contribution and what I'm sure will be a very interesting talk. I'd like to remind you all that you can ask questions in the chat and we'll endeavor to answer them at the end of the presentation. And so now without further ado, I'll hand over to John Mansfield. Thank you, John, and welcome. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your generous introduction. And a huge thank you to Abralen Alvivo and Miguel in particular for this series. Uh, Abralen Alvivo talks have been an enormous uh, source of joy for me during some very difficult times this year. And so I was just delighted when I was invited to contribute to the series. Now, let me just share my slides. Okay, I hope you can all see my slides now. So I will be talking today about the determinants of linear order in morphology and syntax. Um, apologies for any confusion. I earlier had a different title and abstract for this talk in which I was also gonna address sociolinguistic influences in ordering, but that was just one thing too many to be talking about today. So we have to put that one on hold. So the starting point for my talk is a very fundamental principle of grammar, of structure in language, which is that elements of the same grammatical category should appear in the same linear position relative to each other in language. So we can have a range of different linguistic forms filling the role of being a subject NP, and it doesn't matter which one you choose, I, you, she, my cat, they should appear in the same position relative to the auxiliary markers, where, again, the auxiliaries will all occur in the same position simply because they're an auxiliary. So the whole grammatical category shares a single ordering principle, as opposed to, say, each different auxiliary having its own different ordering principles. And we can flip around between different elements while keeping the same grammatical, uh, grammatical category principle in the ordering. Now, this principle is also evident in morphology. A beautiful example comes from Swahili verb structure, where we see in the prefixes to the Swahili verb, there's a clear uh, first position for markers playing the role of subject agreement. Then there's a tense position after that. And then there's another position for markers playing the grammatical role of object agreement. So again, we have elements that are belonging to the same grammatical category and are in this kind of paradigmatic alternation kind of relationship, those grammatical categories, they have a particular position. But this is where things get complicated because we also find examples where elements of the same grammatical category have item specific orderings. So in Fuller, for example, subject markers, uh, when you look at a different subject marker, it can have a different linear position. So the second singular subject marker goes in one position here before the object, whereas the first singular subject marker goes in a different position. So we now have a grammatical paradigm, a set of markers of the same grammatical category, which have item specific ordering. And it's not just in subject and object agreement. We can also see this example from Mangarai case marking, where we have at the top an unmarked absolutive form of a Mangarai noun. And if we then want to pr produce an instrumental form, then we're gonna add a prefix. 
If we instead want to produce an allative form, we're going to add a suffix. And if we want a locative form in Mangarai, we're going to combine a prefix and a suffix. So again, there's this grammatical category of case and the different markers uh, which encode the paradigmatic alternations in this category have item specific ordering. One more example, Mesa Grande de Agueño, the TAM markers, uh, you can have, for example, one tense marker progressive, which comes before the rest of the verb compared to a future tense marker that comes after the rest of the verb. So again, we have here item specific ordering. So we can see then that in morphology, at least, um, markers, affixes, they're not always ordered according to their grammatical category. We also find some of this item specific ordering. But despite these violations of grammatical category ordering, we may still have a feeling that it's at least the norm in morphology. It's what we generally expect to find, perhaps. And indeed, there's a lot of linguistic theory which treats grammatical categories as theoretically driving linear ordering. So based on that, we may also expect it to be the norm. But if we have this expectation, and at the same time, we know that it doesn't always play out that way, this then asks, can we demonstrate whether there's at least a bias towards grammatical category ordering in morphology? So that's the first of the questions I'm gonna be asking today. In fact, I have several questions I raise in today's talk. Another is if there is this bias towards grammatical category ordering, is it stronger in some uh, grammatical domains than others? Do we find differences between different language families? Perhaps the most important question, if there is such a bias in language structure, why does language exhibit this kind of grammatical category ordering? And finally, the question of morphology versus syntax. So most of my talk today focuses on examples from morphology, but a theme underlying everything really is the extent to which morphology and syntax may be similar or different in this. So um, I won't actually be providing answers to all these questions today, but I'll provide at least a decent answer to how we can demonstrate a bias towards category ordering. The one about grammatical domains is really just a question I raise. I will also provide some findings with regards to language family differences. I will provide a tentative hypothesis as to a potential reason why we should find grammatical category ordering in language. And morphology versus syntax, I will address as a question for further research at the end of the talk. So how can we demonstrate if there is indeed a bias towards grammatical category ordering? So what we're going to want to know, if we know that if it looks like um, markers tend to occur in the same position according to the grammatical category, but that's not always the case, we're going to want to know to what extent is the fact, is the extent to which it happens, to what extent is that beyond chance? So um, especially like in the Mesa Grande de Abueño, if you just have essentially a prefix position and a suffix position available, well, you may have grammatical markers that just by chance are both or all occurring in the prefix position. It may not even be a principle at all. There's a certain degree of clustering that can just happen by chance, and we want to know what's happening beyond chance. And as I've mentioned, we're also going to need to be alert to differences between grammatical domains, language families, and other things. So to help us understand the problem more, we can look at data from the World Atlas of Language Structures which has some relevant data on case affixes and TAM affixes. So for example, uh, WOWS has this data on case affixes, which classifies languages with case affixes as having either a prefix position, which is marked by red on the map, or a suffix position marked by blue on the map. So those are languages which exhibit grammatical category ordering in their case markers where there's a particular position, either be it prefix or suffix. And then the gray languages of which you can hardly see any are those documents as having item specific ordering such as we saw in Mangarai. And informally that is only 2% of this data. So I say informally because of course, 
to know whether this is a real finding, an important thing we'd need to know is to what extent languages in this data are related to each other or not, and if there are aerial effects and such. We can also find data in here from TAM affixes. Um, similar case, there's a predominance of languages which either have grammatical category ordering in prefix position, grammatical category ordering in suffix position. Those are the red and blue languages. And again, there's a minority of gray languages which have item specific ordering. Now, interestingly, the gray languages are as a raw percent rather more of the data in this example. They're 15% of languages are like Mesa Grande de Aueño. So this uh, suggests perhaps there is a difference between grammatical domains of case marking versus TAM. But again, this isn't a robust finding, it's just informal. The other limitation of the WALS data is that it's rough grained typological data. So the languages there are classed as having a prefix position for case or a suffix position. And that's just based on kind of predominance. So a language may have mostly prefix case markers and that could count it as being a prefix language. The ones that are counted as being item specific are where it's been decided that there's no obvious dominance like we see here on the right. Maybe if you have a mixture of three prefixes and two suffixes that may be considered no dominant position. But we see that in the actual underlying data, there's gradients here. So to rigorously test this as opposed to the informal look we've just had, we're gonna to need to have a gradient measure that looks at degrees of clustering in particular grammatical paradigms, the degrees to which they cluster in linear positions. So this is gonna to need to be a probabilistic model to um, measure these degrees of positional clustering and the model is gonna to need to incorporate genetic and or aerial relationships. So we've done such a study myself together with Sabina Stoll and Balthazar Bickel from the University of Zurich. And for the data, we turn to Autotype, which is a typological database offering more fine grained typological data. Um, it's item by item typological data. So actually specific affixes are coded as data points rather than just languages as a whole. Now having the specific affixes coded up is gonna allow us to look at for each grammatical paradigm in each language, the degree to which it's clustered in one position. And the richest data available here was on the subject object agreement markers. So much like we saw in the Swahili example at the beginning of this talk. So Autotype offered us subject and object paradigms from 136 languages representing 44 language families. Now, some of these languages offered up both a subject marker paradigm and an object marker paradigm. So the number of paradigms we have in the data is actually 216 paradigms greater than the number of languages. This figure here gives you a first rough look at the data. Um, so these are the 216 paradigms counted in a histogram and they're, posi and they're counted here according, for, according to just how many positions, how many morphotactic positions are used by the paradigm. So you can see one, most of them, uh, the, the greatest set use just one morphotactic position. And that's about half the paradigms are perfectly clustered all into one position. But that actually leaves another half the paradigms where there's some degree of dispersion across multiple morphotactic positions. So we already see there's certainly a fair bit of item specific ordering going on in subject and object agreement morphology. Now, to do our probabilistic model, we actually need to model each paradigm individually because the probabilities to calculate them, you need to know how many affixes are in this paradigm and how many morphotactic positions are available in the analysis of the verb structure. So you can think of it like um, balls being thrown into buckets so your morphotactic positions are like buckets and your paradigm of subject markers is like a set of balls. And what you wanna know is to what extent the balls as they're distributed into buckets, to what extent are they all tending to occur to fall into the same bucket? An example here is the Reyesano subject marker paradigm. So there are five markers in this paradigm and then the Reyesano verb 
uh, it's analyzed as having three uh, affix positions, two prefix positions and one suffix position. And the way the markers are distributed, four of them occur in the same prefix position and one of them occurs in a suffix position. So they're not perfectly clustered according to grammatical category, but there does seem to be a degree of clustering going on here. Now we can work this out more precisely by permuting all the possibilities of how those five markers could be thrown into those three buckets. It turns out there are 243 possible allocations. Now we then want to rank all those possible allocations from the most clustered, i.e. all of them going into one bucket, to the most dispersed, where they're as, as dispersed as possible among the many buckets. So we're going to rank all the possible allocations and then we're going to look at the observed allocation, as we saw before, and see where it sits in that ranking as a percentile. So we can see the actual uh, observed Reyesano morphology is at the 87th most clustered percentile of what it could have been. Now, of course, we have uh, 216 different paradigms in the data. Each one of them, we make this individual calculation according to those parameters. And then we want to look at how those 216 paradigms are distributed across their possibility space from zero to one. Now, if there was no bias towards grammatical category ordering, then we might expect they would be just uniformly distributed across this possibility space. But what we find instead, and this graph breaks the paradigms down into subject markers versus object markers, so we see on the x-axis, we see that possibility space where zero is the most dispersed possible and one is the most clustered possible. And we see there's this really clear bias where these paradigms tend towards being as clustered as possible, while at the same time, you can see all the degrees of violation in the data. There's degrees of item-specific ordering throughout the data. Um, between subject and object, the we're, a uh, probabilistic model we ran found actually very similar estimate for the two uh, median estimate as coming out at 0.86, very much towards the highly clustered end of the scale. We're seeing a similar pattern between sub subject and object markers, but you may notice the difference in the subject paradigms is that in the subject paradigms at the left edge of the data, there's this other lump of paradigms. Now, when we inspect the data, all these paradigms come from just three language families, which are rather overrepresented in the data, Algonquian, Berber, and Kiranti. So what this turns out to be is that these three language families, within those families, there is no bias for subject markers to, be, to have grammatical category ordering. Rather, they're very highly dispersed in those particular language families. So our regression model allows for that by giving language families uh, random intercepts, which then factors it out from the overall estimate of the median. Um, we also ex experimented with looking at geographical area um, random intercepts, but it didn't work out as well. It's better to do it with language family. So in that first uh, little experiment, I've so far been talking about languages as having even either grammatical category-based ordering or item-specific ordering. But there's, of course, a whole other kind of ordering that occurs in language, which is free variation, such as being able to say they arrived already or they already arrived, where either possible order is grammatically, uh, grammatically correct. So we can think of these as grammatical category ordering, item-specific ordering, and then this kind of instance-specific ordering where linguistic elements are just reordered on each specific instance in which they're uttered. And this also occurs in morphology. So one of the best documented examples is in the Sintang language of Nepal, where you have subject prefixes, object prefixes, and negation prefixes, and they can occur in any logically possible order. All are grammatically correct. So the six logically possible orders, I'm just showing three here, and there's no apparent change in meaning between the two. These all seem to have exactly the same meaning. Um, neither could any pragmatic effects be detected, by the way. 
So this just seems to be very free variation in the ordering of these prefixes in Sintang. Now, some people do tend to respond to this by saying well, free variation just doesn't occur in affix ordering, possibly even by definition. Some people may say, well, if they have freely variable ordering, then they must not be affixes. Well, that's, that's one way of looking at it, but let's not uh, just end up having a terminological quibble here. To put it more specifically, let us say that these Sintang prefixes, they have this freely variable ordering. On the other hand, they're obligatory, they're marking grammatical categories, they're firmly attached to the verb, they can't go anywhere else. They're prosodically integrated into the verb. So we can say they tick all the boxes of being morphological affixes apart from the fact that they don't tick the box of having fixed ordering. They have freely variable ordering. And what this actually highlights is that there are these in-between cases in language. There are these phenomena that don't tick all the criteria of being either syntax or morphology, but rather have some mixture of criteria. There are lots of others, basically, much of the stuff that gets called clitics is somewhere in this in-between space. Various types of particles, periphrastic tense, often have this mixture of criteria between syntax and morphology. So I'm gonna come back to that thing at the end of the talk. And I've just listed below, there's some other languages in which variable affix ordering has been attested, just so you don't think it's a, um, just a one-off syntang thing. So in this same study that I did with Stoll and Bickel, we also looked at the Sintang data to examine if Sintang speakers can freely choose any ordering in prefixes when they produce one of these verbs, do they nonetheless show probabilistic biases to some orders rather than others? And if they do show such biases, do those biases look as if they're item specific where just particular individual prefixes have their own biases, or do we see patterns according to grammatical category in this data? So the prefixes we focused on were one negator prefix, my, and then two different subject prefixes, ah and u. Um, so other subject markers don't occur as prefixes in Sintang. And then there are two object prefixes, ka and ma. So the important point is that these two prefixes ar and u are both of the same grammatical category, and that's different from ka and ma that are both of the object grammatical category, and then you have my that's in its own category. Uh, simplifying some details there. So we looked at a uh, corpus of naturalistic syntang speech, which allowed us to extract 576 observations of verbs where uh, two or more of these prefixes were used together. And that data provided for all logical combinations between uh, all those prefixes. And nicely, actually, in the data, for every logical combination, both orders were attested. So the naturalistic speech data further supports the idea that there's free variation going on in these syntongue prefixes. So every possible order of any two prefixes, A and B, always showed some variability, but do they diverge from equiprobability where it's just 50-50? And if they're not equiprobable, if there is a bias towards AB versus BA, then does that pattern by grammatical category? Well, we found that it did pattern by grammatical category. So the larger figure there at the bottom shows you the U prefix, how it occurs in conjunction with the my prefix, the negator. And what we see is that there is quite a bias towards that all subject marker occurring before the negator. And it's not compatible with equiprobability. It's too statistically unlikely that uh, you would find that particular frequency if it was actually underlying equiprobability. When we then turn instead to the a subject marker and look at that, how, how that co-occurs with the negator, we again find there's a bias of the R subject marker to occur before the negator rather than after it. But crucially, the bias runs in the same direction as the other subject marker. So rather than having item specific biases, which they could have had in different directions, they seem to have the same bias in the same direction. And interestingly, in this data, the magnitude of the bias looks very similar. 
When we then turn to the two different object markers and look at how they occur in comparison to subject markers, we again find the two different object markers uh, both have a bias to occur before a subject marker. So they're again, both have this bias in the same direction. And overall, the most elegant analysis of this data would be something like a probabilistic template where object markers tend to occur before subject markers, subject markers tend to occur before negators. And the patterning here seems to be by grammatical category rather than just individual affixes having their own individual biases. So taking stock of what we've seen, we've seen that in 136 languages from autotype, there's, uh, and these are all languages where there's fixed ordering of affixes, that there seems to be a bias towards grammatical category, category ordering over item specific ordering. But this bias is not hegemonic. So there are many violations in the data. There are many instances where there is item specific ordering, but nonetheless, this is overall bias and some language families don't conform to the bias. There are non-conformist language families like uh, Berber and Karanti and uh, Algonquian. We also saw a bias, a production bias among Sintang speakers when they're producing these verbs which have variable affix ordering. So we see here some convergent evidence towards a general bias towards grammatical category ordering, which of course, leads to the question of why. Why should this bias occur in the way that um, fixed order affix systems have evolved and also occur in the online speech production of Sintang speakers? And we explore the idea that that convergent bias could be based on a learning bias. Learning and or cognitive processing of language could be preferring items of the same grammatical category to occur in the same linear position. And there's some evidence for a bias of this nature in syntax in uh, acquisitional literature, but we've gone on to test it in uh, L2 learning of an artificial language. So we've set up an artificial language learning experiment with adult speakers of English as the participants. And we asked them to learn a miniature artificial language, and we test whether they learn that language better if there's grammatical category ordering in the affix structure compared to when there isn't, when there's item specific ordering. Now, this study is still under review, so I'm just going to be offering a somewhat brief preview of it today. And this is work I've done together with Carmen Saldana, uh, Peter Hurst, Rachel Nordlinger, Sabina Stoll, Balthazar Bickel, and Andy Perforce. We have an all star cast on this paper. So we set up the experiment with these images and labels, which people are invited to learn. They're, of course, not explained what uh, they're trying to learn exactly. They're just told they're trying to learn this little made up language. And the images, like you see the red cross there at the bottom left, um, then alternate with other images like two green crosses. And so one red cross is Kalidati, but two green crosses are Kalimuni, and one blue cross is Kalivoti. So they get these alternations between the color and the number of the images. And you probably start to notice that the stem form of these uh, words is attached to the shape. And then there are suffixes marking the color and number. Soba suvo, soba nida, soba voti, different colors and numbers of a star. So we ran this with 300 participants as I mentioned, all adult English speakers recruited via Amazon MTurk. And importantly, they were put into different experimental conditions according to principles of linear ordering. So some lucky participants were allocated to the category ordered morphology. In this morphology, there's a consistent position for color suffixes immediately after the stem and number suffixes always occur after that. So you can think of this as a grammar, something like Swahili. Other participants were put in an item specific morphology where particular combinations of color suffix and number suffix have particular specific orderings. So there's no consistency according to the color and number categories in what position they occur in. You can think of this as a language a bit like Fula. 
Finally, some participants were given a variable order morphology where on each, so it's instance specific, perhaps more technically, on each uh, individual presentation of an image, the two suffixes were just randomly ordered. You can think of this as a language a bit like Sintang, except it's even a bit worse than Sintang because uh, you have equiprobable 50-50 ordering rather than there being a bias. So participants were taught these images and labels in blocks, and then they were tested on the accuracy of their learning through a forced choice test. So a bit like what you see here, except the morphology was not shown. I'm just showing that for demonstration purposes. Uh, so the right label here might be Kalidati for one red cross. Um, and all the distractors have the right stem for the shape, but they all make one or two errors in the suffixes. So it was really testing the participants on whether they'd learnt to identify the form with the correct suffixes compared to other forms of the same with the same stem. And just to preview the results here, you can see here on the left um, the, the results. And so the purple uh, at the top are uh, participants in the, um, in the grammatical category ordering morphology. And you can see immediately they've done slightly better. Then in between in the blue color are those in the item specific morphology. And then the yellow color at the bottom is those in the um, variable order morphology. Now you also see here along the x-axis as they go from left to right, they're progressing through three blocks of training and testing. As they progress through, they're asked to remember more and more words from the language, more and more combinations of color and number for each shape. And you see that across all conditions, they did worse as they were asked to learn more and more words. But interestingly, the purple color, the um, grammatical category ordering, they weren't as, um, they didn't drop off as much as the green the green uh, condition with the item specific ordering, they were the ones who dropped off the most, especially as they got into the third block where they had to uh, remember more forms. So some tentative findings from this, um, it, the findings do seem to support the idea the overall accuracy was higher in the grammatical category ordering compared to the two different conditions that didn't have grammatical category ordering. And also, those who have the item specific ordering appear to do better than those who have free variation in the suffix ordering. So this is actually quite nice in the way it's compatible with what we see in natural languages, because as I showed in the earlier experiment, there's actually a large amount of item specific ordering in languages of the world. So it shouldn't be that difficult to learn. Whereas free variation of affix order does seem to be quite rare. So perhaps these findings are actually compatible with what we see in natural languages. As I showed in the graph, we also found that as participants were asked to learn more different word forms, their accuracy went down. And interestingly, those in the item specific condition suffered the most from having to expand out to a bigger set of word forms. Now there's a possible explanation for this. It could be that, um, Perhaps different participants use different mixtures of a uh, whole word learning strategy versus a compositional strategy where they're actually um, breaking things down into affixes and learning individual affixes. Now, if that was the case, then you would expect that the whole word learning strategy would suffer more as you have to learn more different uh, combinations in different word forms compared to if you're learning the individual affixes, then you should just be able to reuse your learning of those affixes as you have to deal with more different word forms. So the finding that the item specific condition suffered most could be because they were actually using more whole word learning as opposed, as opposed to compositional learning. This is an interesting hypothesis. Now, finally, I'd like to turn back to this question of uh, syntax versus morphology. So I've been presenting this talk mostly as about morphology, but um, there's this kind of theme running through it because as we saw right at the beginning, uh, this principle of grammatical category-based ordering also seems to be a strong feature of phrase structure, of syntax. 
And in fact, when we compare syntax versus morphology, we might expect that grammatical category ordering should be more a feature of syntax compared to item specific ordering in morphology. And I say this based on literature that characterizes morphology as being more idiosyncratic, irregular and arbitrary compared to syntactic structure that's more grammatically orderly. So like we saw at the beginning, phrase structures seem to have this nice grammatical category ordering like subject, auxiliary, verb. But item specific ordering does also occur in syntax. So Samoan, for example, has these TAM particles, uh, therefore apparently part of phrase structure and different um, TAM particles have different linear positions. See there, the past marker has a different position from the general tense in Samoan. Similarly, uh, we can look at ad positions in Koromfe where some ad positions such as the instrumental occur in a prepositional position before the noun phrase they're associated with. Others like the locative occur as a post position after the noun phrase they're associated with. So again, we're seeing this item specific ordering within the grammatical category of ad positions. So actually this binary split between grammatical ordering in syntax versus item specific ordering in morphology, we can't maintain it as a binary. We can see that both kinds of ordering occur on both linguistic levels. So we already saw morphology actually has a mixture of grammatical category ordering and item specific ordering. Syntax also clearly has some kind of mixture. We may nonetheless suppose that there could be a difference in degree. Maybe syntax has a greater degree of grammatical category ordering compared to morphology. And that remains yet to be tested. But I also raised earlier in today's talk that this, the binary split itself between syntax and morphology is not always easy to maintain. So we saw that in Sintang and other languages, which I just briefly cited, that you have things that look like affixes, they look like morphology, but they have free variation in ordering, which therefore some people would say makes them look less like morphology. Some people may even say that means they're not morphology. So it's this and many other phenomena in language that actually suggest syntax versus morphology as something more like a multi-dimensional space. We have different kinds of linguistic phenomena that are more or less like morphology or like syntax. Perhaps a lot of phenomena are kind of cluster neatly into one type or the other, but perhaps there's a lot of stuff that's in between. Like I said before, all kinds of clitics, compounding can often show kind of mixed, mixed criteria. And I cited there some papers below that go into this in a great amount of detail. Now, if this is the case, if syntax and morphology is actually a multidimensional space, then principles of ordering I'd like to propose actually give us a really nice way to explore this multidimensional space in further research. So for example, we could look at a particular grammatical domain and look at how it's marked in morphology versus syntax. And even better if we drill down to what makes particular, place, particular instances more or less morphological or syntactic. And for example, we might see that case marking when it's done via affixes, what are, or what are at least described as affixes, we can look at the degree to which that has grammatical category ordering as in this uh, figure I showed earlier. And then we can compare it to case add positions as we just saw in Koromfe, basically the same grammatical function, same grammatical category, but now uh, said to be more syntactic according to various criteria. And we can see to what extent is that similar or different to the um, morphological equivalents. And also I've raised variable ordering in this talk, which of course, again, brings up this um, difference between morphology and syntax. So variable ordering is of course, uh, much more widely attested in phrase structure in things that are seen as being obviously syntactic, like they already arrived, they arrived already. And in those phenomena, uh, we have all kinds of principles apparently at work. So the grammatical categories of the items seem to be playing some kind of role, but we know that pragmatics is also playing a huge role in that kind of ordering. And what's somewhat underappreciated is the degree to which phonological harmony 
can often also be shown to play a role in preferring one order over another. Um, there's excellent work by this on this by Stephanie Shi. So ultimately, we've got all these different principles which can potentially be used to order elements in language. And you can actually see the, the human mind that's learning and processing language as having to deal with competition between many potential principles, grammatical ordering, pragmatics, entrenched item specific orders, and phonological harmony. And the question then ultimately is when we look at different kinds of linguistic structure, some of which are more morphology-like and some of which are more syntax-like, to what extent do these different ordering principles have stronger or weaker roles in each? So that's a big question for lots of further research. But to summarise what I've talked about today, um, grammatical category ordering seems to be very fundamental in language and we can demonstrate it as a probabilistic bias in morphology, but it's also a very exceptional principle. So we saw in particular in verbal agreement marking in uh, 136 languages from autotype, we found an overall bias towards paradigms exhibiting grammatical category ordering. We also found a production bias in Sintang when speakers can freely order prefixes they show biases which seem to be governed by the grammatical category of the prefixes rather than just item specific. And I explored um, a potential explanation for this. Perhaps there's a learning bias, which means that uh, humans can learn things better when they have this grammatical category ordering principle at work. So I previewed some results there. And finally, I just opened up the question about to what extent is this a syntactic thing versus a morphological thing? And how can we further explore syntax and morphology as a multi-dimensional space in which different kinds of ordering principles may be at work? So that's it from me. And I believe we may now have some discussion. Thanks so much, John, for a really interesting, fascinating talk. Uh, and just a reminder to everyone, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I will put them to John. Um, but in the meantime, John, I'd like to kick off by asking you to just talk a little bit more about, so at, at the end there, you were talking about the, this issue of um, morphology and syntax and, and, and the different sorts of um, ordering principles we might find in these domains. And I was wondering if I could just explore that a bit more with you do you what are your do you have any particular expectations about whether you would expect the same biases across both these domains so would you expect do, are you expecting to find the same sorts of biases in syntax that you find in morphology would you are you expecting the same learning bias for example um, um are there yeah. potential differences there yeah, so my expectation is very much that that this bias is also at work in syntax. And I think most linguists would agree with that. And it's it's been so successful really as a kind of underlying assumption when we analyze languages that the linear ordering is controlled mostly by the grammatical categories. And we would have noticed um, very strongly if that assumption wasn't well-founded, but, I think we, we so we clearly have some exceptions, as I showed there from um, uh, Korom Fair and uh, another language I can't remember right now. Um, but these exceptions then show that it, it can't just be an inviolable principle underlying everything. So um, while I assume that that there will generally be a bias towards this in syntax, I think it can be productive to investigate it as one bias among many which are competing. And um, because syntax apparently shows so much more free variation compared to morphology, I think that actually highlights the way that grammatical category-based ordering is often actually you know, having this competition in syntax where especially pragmatic principles may be competing with the the drive to put things of the same grammatical category into the same position. So do you find in your research, have you found 
So for example, we know that, as you say, pragmatic principles are found in syntax of like you, you can have um, variable ordering in syntax that are conditioned by pragmatic principles. In your research, have you found pragmatic principles operating in morphological ordering, for example? Is that something that maybe is different between the two domains or? Yeah, th this is an interesting, interesting question which hasn't really been researched. Um, but I, I've not encountered any example that looks as if there is a pragmatic drive in very affix-like things. Um, in the Sintang instance, uh, I believe Balthazar Bickel has uh, looked into it in his fieldwork and couldn't find any sign of there being kind of pragmatic um, conditioning or pragmatic preferences. And certainly when I was looking through the corpus data, I was, uh, you know, alert for this, but again, just couldn't find any, anything that looked like a sign of that. Um, so based on what we know so far, it's, there's potential that as things become, you know, more integrated into a single word form, that perhaps the potential for pragmatic conditioning uh, becomes um, neutralized, perhaps you might say. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I wonder too, with, so phonological, um, harmony, for example, we know operates in morphology. Do we find examples of syntactic word order or category ordering being conditioned by phonological harmony? Yeah, yeah. So I um, just briefly cited there some work from Stephanie Shi and, uh, and Kizura, um, where, yeah, I think it's somewhat underappreciated, but for various languages, when people have looked at um, variable free variation in ordering, there's a really nice example from Tagalog. Uh, it's been found that, so there can be grammatical category principles at work as well. In Tagalog, I think it's a general preference for the adjective to go before the noun in a, when an adjective is modifying a noun. But then there's kind of in competition with that, there's a phonological harmony principle where if there's particular like clashes of, uh, two nasals in a row, then you, you may actually prefer a flipped order instead. And I think in English, some of the best attested examples instead uh, involve stress and people trying to avoid um, adjacent stressed syllables. So I think this has been a little um, underappreciated, partly because of models of language where we expect that the, you know, the syntax and the morphology kind of happens first and then gets sent get sent to the phonology. So the phonology shouldn't be feeding back onto the syntax or morphology, but there are, it does actually seem to happen. And I think we may find over time that it's happening more than, more than had been realized. Interesting. So there's a, there's a question in the chat here. Um, we, might another dimension be um, that, that's involved here be whether the category is open. So nouns, for example, versus closed as in agreement markers. Is that another sort of factor that might uh, come yeah. into play? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question, which I was um, too afraid to even touch on today. Uh, <laughs> when I looked at grammatical categories, yeah, I was mostly, I was generally just sticking to um, nice closed classes. But once you look at, especially like major constituent order where you've got lexical classes of, um, you know, subject nouns and object nouns, um, then it opens up a whole other question of can you have item specific ordering? There's some interesting evidence there actually, again, from noun adjective combinations. Uh, French has been analyzed to a great extent. So French has some degree of flexibility in how the noun and the adjective are ordered. And uh, I think they can have slightly different shades of, of pragmatics or meaning, but I believe there are also at least some tendencies that may attach to specific adjectives as opposed to others. So that could be an example where we actually find a little bit of item specificity at work also in open classes. But as for things like, you know, like lexical nouns in su uh, like subject and object role in compared to a verb, um, I certainly haven't seen anything proposing that to have like item specific ordering and perhaps we might be surprised if it did. Mm -hmm. Um, another question in the chat here, um, is there a way you think you could integrate scopal effects in your artificial grammar learning survey? So for example, the, the so-called 
universal of number being ordered closer to the stem than case. So those sorts of scopal properties. Yeah, it could be really interesting to do um, an experiment in which both of those were manipulated as independent variables, whether you have grammatical category ordering and whether your language um, conforms to conforms to um, proper scope or not. And yeah, perhaps you could place the two in competition and see which one wins. <laughs> it's an interesting suggestion. Um, so another question I had then is this, this bias that you've identified that, and, and potentially a learning bias, um, that, that the biases towards category clustering. Mm. Could it also be that this bias is actually related or, or um, conditioned by the way, I mean, you've shown it in morphology. So is it, how much is it about the way morphology comes about? How much is it about this sort of historical process where um, we know that, well, at least it's been claimed for many years, the, the you know, today's morphology, yesterday's syntax, today's morphology, is, is this clustering bias or this tendency towards grad, uh, clustering in morphology actually a, a product of historical processes that actually generate the morphology in the first place? Yeah. Yeah, I, this is a really pertinent question. And um, so far we've explored uh, learning as um, as a potential explanation, but it, it doesn't rule out the potential that uh, grammatical category ordering in morphology could also to some extent um, just be a historical relic of, order, of earlier grammatical category ordering in syntax. Um, uh, I think that's, you know, that's basically an empirical question, um, which it, it could sort of go either way. A couple of things are, um, so yeah, there's a very famous um, Givon quote about uh, today's morphology being yesterday's syntax. Um, but the extent to which that is true, I think is one thing that we need to keep an eye on there because it's also, there are also many attested examples where morphology develops in its own ways. Um, you know, things get reanalyzed, things get moved around. Um, so there isn't necessarily like this clean reflection between current morphology and some previous syntax. And if um, there is, but if there was, um, grammatical category ordering in syntax and it was being maintained in morphology as opposed to it being lost and reanalyzed, then that could also actually show that even as things become morphology, their, their persistence of ordering may nonetheless um, be part of a bias rather than just a kind of automatic outcome of the history. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah, kind of a range of interesting questions there. Mm -hmm. And if it did turn out to largely come down to the history in the syntax, then that would still leave us the question about why languages prefer grammatical category ordering anyway, but it kind of flipped the question back onto syntax especially. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got another question about the artificial language learning task. Yes. Um, so I, I guess the question is about to what extent the the results are are about um, the fact that that in this task it's a, it's about a second language or a, a non first language I guess that people are, are, are learning rather than their first yeah. language. So, for example, when children learn their first language, they have to learn both to category they have to learn the categorization process itself, and then they have to learn how to apply it to language. While whereas adults. That, that you're testing in this um, artificial task have, have learned the categorization process already. So it's a, it, you know, to what yeah. extent is it the same sort of learning task, I, I suppose, and, and might you expect the biases to be impacted by that? Yeah, that is that is a really interesting point. Um, so there's, a, there's an interesting question in there about um, the extent to which categorization that people have already learned in their first language, in this case, their first language English speakers, to what extent that carries over into their learning of this very artificial language. Um, we used one grammatical category here as number, 
which of course you also have in English, although we actually had a singular dual plural split. So the, the values within that category weren't the same as what people had already learned. And we also used color as a grammatical category here, even though it's not certainly not uh, well attested as a, as a grammatical category in natural languages, but simply for um, practical purposes, it's quite easy to set up in one of these experiments. So people were being asked to learn these categories Although we should also note that they're rather different from the kind from the categories they already spoke in their first language, um, and I also agree that in all these artificial language learning experiments, we need to be very alert to the kind of the ecological validity and the differences between what we're asking people to do and what's actually happening in. Um, natural language conditions and in people's learning of their first languages and all the social conditions through which language happens. But there can still be a value in it if we can identify biases which are happening even under these completely different conditions, then in some ways, you know, that can be seen as an argument that this does seem to be a general bias. So, yeah, what we're asking people to do here is very different from learning any of those 136 languages as a child in uh, autotype. But if we find the same kind of bias in both, then you know that in itself could be a good argument that we're onto something here. Thank you. Um, so perhaps a, a final question, although I'll keep my eye on the chat. Um, you, when you're talking about category clustering and, and you were talking about um, particularly about subject and object uh, markers and um, the way in which they're clustered morphologically, it made me think about, you know, many languages that, that order their um, subject and object markers, not, not actually by grammatical function, but perhaps by person or animacy hierarchies or so on. And I'm wondering how those sorts of systems relate to this category clustering? Is that just another type of category clustering in your view or is that something yeah. different? And what would our expectations be about how those languages yeah. work? Yeah, you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, that actually there's multiple kinds of category. Uh, these, some affixes actually belong to multiple different categories. They both belong to the subject category and they also belong to the first person category. So, they now they could uh, pattern with the other subject markers, or they could pattern with the other first person markers. Um, the Algonquian effect in that experiment is probably partly to do with that. So the Algonquian languages um, That's do what made the, me think of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do we have this uh, person hierarchy at work? Um, the Karanti languages, I think, tend to just look much more. Um, complex and just highly dispersed in their morphological positioning. And I think that was also the case for the Berber. So yeah, I think that's, that's part of the story, um, which suggests that grammatical category ordering is possibly even stronger than what is shown in those results. But we have additionally this like competition between different kinds of grammatical categories, which means that you end up having imperfect grammatical category ordering in each different category. Right. Lots more to investigate and think about, I guess. Thanks so much for the questions and discussion. Really yeah, so um, I think I'll just check if there's any further questions, though. I think we'll, um, I'll just thank John once again for a fabulous presentation on behalf of Avrilin and also all of us who've enjoyed it, and invite everyone to keep watching this amazing series. There's lots of great talks coming up and many more already available on YouTube. So please make the most of them. And uh, thanks very much, John, for a very stimulating talk. Thanks again, Rachel. And thank you to Miguel and Abralin. Okay. Bye.